Welcome back. UFOs, are they real? We're talking with John Lear on the subject. Previously on the UFO Reporter, most commonly described alien is about three and a half feet tall, has a round head, arms reaching to or below his knees, and is wearing a silvery spacesuit or coveralls. Our guest on this particular day canceled. Who could we get to fill this? I called up John Lear. I said, you said you had a guy who was going to work out there and maybe work on flying saucers in the desert. Can we talk to him? Well, there's several, uh, actually nine, uh, flying saucers, flying discs. I don't even know his name. He used a pseudonym, and out this story comes. That are out there of extraterrestrial origin. I get pulled off the set. The general manager comes back. What the hell was that? Is this for real? What did you just do? His real name is Robert Lazar. He says he earned degrees in physics and electronics, but the schools we contacted say they've never heard of him. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. And tonight, George digs deeper, searching for the truth. Did you knowingly lie? I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Look, I don't know if it's real, but I'm going to find out. The Area 51 whistleblower comes under fire. We got threatening phone calls. He'll never make it back here. And George gets the attention of the U.S. government. We were followed. So they were definitely listening to you. They were listening to my phone. Along with two secret allies, all paving the way for an unprecedented twist inside the halls of the U.S. Capitol. A multi-decade crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. Oh, this is serious. It's been serious for a long time, and it's been ignored for way too long. The keepers of the secrets are better at their job than people like us are at ours, and they are not going to let this thing go easily. For over 30 years, investigative journalist George Knapp has fearlessly taken on the biggest mysteries, crimes, and scandals. Tonight, we examine a few additional UFO cases. From the Las Vegas mob. The murder of Alan Dorfman was never solved, nor was the bombing of Frank Rosenthal's car. To strange phenomena in the sky. There is some kind of a phenomenon here that can't just be written off. Covering it all just the same. I've always approached it as a news story. It's not my religion, it's not a belief. I don't know what to believe even now. Now News Nation is bringing you unprecedented access to his archives that date back decades, and how his life's work still influences the conversation on UFOs to this day. 36 years later, I'm still trying to figure it out. I was so cocky in the beginning. Well, this field is a mess. This is just, you know, 95% of this stuff is nonsense and it's explainable, it's prosaic. And I figured, well, look, I mean, what this topic needs is a good reporter. I'll have this all whipped into shape in six months. And of course, I was ridiculously optimistic. Six months turned into a 36-year Las Vegas career for investigative reporter George Knapp. Did you have any interesting meetings with anyone UFO-related around here? Do you go to any certain restaurants or? All of them. I mean, the Pepper Mill, uh, where we grabbed lunch, that was like my office annex. I would meet all kinds of people from Area 51 there. George helped reveal the very existence of Area 51 through his interviews with Bob Lazar. Tonight we're going to delve a little deeper into the subject with the man who was the impetus for our reports in the first place, Bob Lazar. Bob, good to have you here. Um, a thumbnail sketch of yourself for those who might not be familiar with, with your background. Lazar was a young scientist who claimed to work at the secret base called Area 51 near Groom Lake in an especially hidden area called S4 where Lazar claimed crashed UFOs were stored. Actually, nine flying saucers, flying discs. This came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there. I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is and in, in physics, and it's, it can't be done. This is one of George's reports from 1989 about what exactly Lazar says he saw. According to Lazar, his employer was the United States Navy. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. When you get off the bus, what do you see? It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees. The uh, which are hangar doors. 
and it has textured paint on it, but it's, it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. He says he was never told exactly what he'd be working on, but figured it had something to do with advanced propulsion. On his first day, he was told to read a series of briefings and immediately realized how advanced the propulsion was. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. There's actually two parts to the drive mechanism. Uh, it's just, it's a bizarre technology. There's no physical hookup between any of the systems in there. Uh, they use gravity as a wave using waveguides, almost like microwaves. It took a while, Lazar says, before he actually saw one of the flying disks. However, there were hints everywhere. Right, they had a poster, and it looked like a commercial poster almost, like it was lithographed and you could buy it at a Kmart or something. But they were all over the place, and it had the, the disk that I coined the term the sport model was lifted off the ground about three feet at, at uh, area S4 on the dry lake there, and uh, the catch on the bottom said they're here. And uh, those are just all over the place. Later, he got to see the real thing. When I was let in, it was the first time I saw the sport model in the hangar sitting down, and uh, I was told they could have walked me in the front door, but they purposely wanted to walk me by it. I was told not to say anything and just keep my eyes forward and, and walk past the disc into the office area. And I did, and uh, as we went by it, I just kind of stuck my hands on it <laughs> just to run it alongside the thing. And, uh, you know, I, that, that was about the smallest time. After that, I got to see it uh, actually lift off the ground and operate. But you, you also, in between that, you saw more than one. Yeah. The hangars are all connected together, and there are large bay doors between each one. And uh, there were nine total that I saw each one being different, like they had the uh, assortment pack. One of the nine flying disks he says he saw at the base, which was designated S-4, looks exactly like this UFO photographed in Europe. Lazar called it the sport model. I, I gave everything simple names. There's a, the top hat one and, you know, I, the jello mold. and uh, The sport model you know, operated, you know, without any hitches at all. I mean, it, it looked new. If I can, if I know what a new flying saucer looks like. Um, one of them looked like it was hit with some sort of projectile. Even before he saw the sport model operate, Lazar says, he suspected that the ship came from somewhere else. The realization slapped him in the face the first time he glimpsed the inside of the disc. I got to look inside and it had really small chairs and I think that was the first confirmation I had. That was just a shocking thing because it Every time before that, I was able to label it, well, this is just oh, a little advance that a group of scientists had formed, and, you know, they're keeping it secret. And, yeah, we could have built a big disk like that. That's no problem. And, you know, we could have adapted these to make it fly, but why does it have little furniture inside, essentially little seats? And, now it, and things began to click together just all too fast. A few of the disks had been completely dismantled to find out how they worked, Lazar says, but others were fully operational. The bottom of it glowed blue and began to hiss like any, like high voltage does on a, on a round sphere. Uh, it's my impression that uh, the reason that they're round and have no sharp edges is to contain the high voltage, like uh, if you've seen on in high voltage systems, insulators, things are round or else you get a corona discharge. In, in, in either case, um, it began to hiss as in high voltage and it lifted off the ground quietly yeah, except with that little hiss in the background, then that stopped as soon as it reached about 20, 30 feet. Lazar's interview with George got attention far beyond Las Vegas. Suddenly, people around the world were paying attention to it. There was something called Paranet that was transcribing every piece as it aired, and then they'd send it all over the world via this fledgling technology called the Internet. There were people dubbing it off and then showing it in movie theaters and charging admission to it. We got inquiries from all over the world, other media everywhere. When that Lazar part of the story broke in episode 5, 6, and 7, Man, it, it went to a different level. Lazar was credible enough for the Nippon TV network. Nippon devoted two hours of prime time to a special on Lazar and UFOs in March. Lazar was invited to go to Japan to interview with reporters there. But along with all the attention came disturbing threats. The day we were supposed to go, I had tickets in hand, even went down and bought yen down at the uh, uh, currency exchange. Uh, you know, we got threatening phone calls. I mean, that, that basically said, you'll never make it back here. 
So we really sat down and just thought, how important really is the interview, and we didn't go. Lazar told George that security was tight and that fear and intimidation was used as a brainwashing tool. It did everything but physically hurt me. Put a gun to your head? Yeah. And, and said what? what? Actually put a gun to your head? Well, they, it, they did that even in the, in the original security briefings. They had uh, uh, guards there with M16s and guys slamming their finger into my chest, screaming in my ear, some people pointing weapons at me. Uh, like I said, it's not, a, it's not a good place to work. When you came out with the series and then the special, was there a pushback? Yeah, well there was. And during the making of the, uh, there was pushback. We were followed, me, Lazar, a couple of others of us. I know it's hard to believe that, that they would go to that trouble, uh, but they knew I was working with him. They knew I was, what I was digging into. They would go to his house when he wasn't there, open up the doors and windows, write stuff on his blackboard, move things around, just to mess with his head. He went to the gym one time with a friend of his. He was really getting kind of panicky about the whole thing. He has a gun, he had an Uzi in his car for self-protection. He goes into the gym, has a workout, comes out an hour later, the doors of the car are open, the windows are rolled down, the Uzi, which had been in a glove box, was there sitting on the front seat. They were just letting him know that they're watching. Coming up, threats and also questions about whether Bob Lazar was telling the truth about what he saw at Area 51. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? No. The results of several lie detector tests. I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Plus, as soon as they talked to me, they got visited the next day by people proclaiming to be government agents. More sources coming forward as the government ramps up their intimidation tactics when we come back. They had, uh, Guards there with M16s, and guys slamming their finger into my chest, screaming in my ear, some people pointing weapons at me. Uh, like I said, it's not, a, it's not a good place to work. It was one of the standout scoops for famed UFO reporter George Knapp. His interviews with Bob Lazar, a young scientist who claimed to have worked at Area 51. But was Bob Lazar telling the truth? George put him to the test in a series of reports. Lazar agreed to undergo a polygraph exam as part of this report. Polygrapher Ron Slay asked about the technology Lazar had seen. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? No. The results of this exam were inconclusive. Lazar appeared to be truthful on one test, deceitful on a second. Slay recommended that a second examiner be brought in. Polygrapher Terry Tavernetti runs a corporate security operation and is a former Los Angeles police officer. He put Lazar through four tests and concluded there was no attempt to deceive. And I left there thinking that uh, I feel we do have some credibility uh, to what uh, the subject had to say. Uh, and that's when I went to some of my colleagues. Tavernetti sent the test results to a third polygrapher who agreed the results appeared truthful. The charts were then sent to a fourth examiner who did not agree, suggesting Lazar might be relating information he'd learned from someone else. The polygraphers conferred and decided they would not issue a final statement on truthfulness until more specific testing can be conducted. And that's where it stands. Tavernetti believes that difficulty in determining Lazar's truthfulness stems from the fear that was drilled into him. I think we're talking about a subject here that is so far reaching uh, and it is so emotional. And when you're dealing with emotions, this is polygraph, because we're dealing in polygraph, you're looking at fear. The fear of getting caught telling a lie because something bad will happen to you if you do. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, uh, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. And uh, I had a, an extremely small part in it, but I'm convinced that what I saw is absolute proof of that. There is, there is no way we could have created those systems. There's no way we could have made the disks, the power supplies, anything to go with them. You believe his story, don't you? Yeah, I do. 
Yeah, I've, I've got to know him uh, pretty well over the last couple of months, and uh, I believe he's telling the truth. George's connection to Bob Lazar led other tipsters to start calling him. But again, there was intimidation that made his quest to learn more increasingly difficult. I had people call me during those projects, those first two, who offered to give me information about reverse engineering flying saucers. Six of them right in a row were visited. As soon as they talked to me, they got visited the next day by people proclaiming to be government agents who told them, shut the hell up. Even one of the polygraph examiners, former police officer Terry Tavernetti, says shortly after his involvement with Lazar was made public, his employers were contacted. If the corporate offices, where I'm employed, received a telephone call from a government agency wanting to know why I was getting involved in something that uh, I shouldn't be. And I asked, well, what agency, what was said, did they identify themselves? And I said, because I'll be more than happy to talk to them. Uh, and I was refused this information, told that uh, he didn't know meaning my boss. Tavernetti says his house was also burglarized around the time he did Lazar's polygraph. As an investigator of over 20 years, I don't believe in coincidences. There's a right reason for everything. Uh, I mean, could it have been a random residential burglary? Uh, yes. One case, the source was a cop. He worked at the courthouse, and she worked at the courthouse as a court reporter. And he said, she told me one time uh, over lunch that she had worked for a defense contractor and heard this information about Roswell and wreckage and bodies and it being stored out in, in the Nevada desert. I asked this cop friend, would she talk to me? He goes, I think so, here's her number. So I called her and she gave me the broad strokes of, of her story. I said, can we meet? I'll, if I need to hide your face or uh, your identity, change your name, I will. The very next day, she gets visited by these two guys. They told her, you know, you're still subject to your security clearance. And then they go, we know your daughter lives in LA and that you travel across the desert to see her and she comes to see you. It's a big desert out there. It'd be a shame if something happened to either one of you. This is a veiled threat, not so veiled threat. She was scared to death. Not only wouldn't talk to me, I called her 10 years later after she had left that job, and she still wouldn't talk to me. So they were definitely listening to you? They were listening to my phone, and it really pissed me off. I mean, they couldn't have obtained a warrant to do it. No judge in, in Nevada would approve something like that. They wanted to know who was offering to give me information, and it really made me mad. Again, I was already sort of on a crusade because of the, the FOIA documents, the paper trail, and the lies. This really got under my skin, and so we produced another nine-part series in May of uh, 1990, and it hit even harder. And that sort of sealed the deal for me. It made me the, the UFO reporter, whether I like it or not. Coming up next, the UFO reporter was about to get two of his best sources. I've been interested in the subject for a long time. You've said that you don't think it's little green men. Is it possible that nobody really, there's no one who knows the ultimate answer? I don't think no one has the answer. I'm anxious to get the facts. I think it's something we should look into. U.S. Senator and a rich American businessman take George's UFO reporting places he never imagined. It was George Knapp's bombshell 1989 interview with young scientist Bob Lazar that opened the door to new UFO sources. Two really important things that happened in association with that project. One was Harry Reid. Nevada Senator Harry Reid saw George's UFO series and was interested. You know, George, I'll have to look at this. I have heard about this exact story. I've heard about it uh, as kind of a preview of your program. I am visiting with you once before. I'm anxious to get the facts. I think it's something we should look into. He says, yeah, well, I'm going back to Washington. My car will pick you up. You can talk to me on the way to the airport. And so I spilled the beans to him, what I'd learned so far. He didn't kick me out of his car. He was interested. He said at the end, well, look, keep, keep me in the loop and I'll do the same for you. And that friendship that sort of started there, the secret conversation started that day. It lasted for the rest of his life and had a major effect on my life. Senator Reid visited Area 51 several times over the years, but never commented to George on the record about what he saw. I had never wanted to ask you on the record because I know there are limits on what you can say, but you've been there multiple well, times. I've been there quite a few times, and that was something that was really necessary, uh, especially with the Soviets, with their satellites. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I look at today, I see things that were experimental up there that are now everyday deals. 
Were there a lot of off-the-record conversations? Oh, yeah. Documents he would give you that you weren't reporting on? For years and years and years. It would uh, ebb and flow at different times, depending on what else I was working on. I'd go to Washington, if not every year, every other year, to interview our congressional delegation and always made a point to spend time with them. And he'd always pull me aside, and we'd have our own little UFO conversation out of ear reach of his staff. Drove them crazy. Drove them crazy, crazy for years because neither one of us would tell them what it was about. Now, after a while, they figured it out. And George, as you know, I uh, became terribly interested in this. And rather than uh, think about it, I said, well, I'm gonna do something about it. In 2007, Reed and other senators authorized the Black Budget Study of UFOs, OSAP, which stands for Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Application Program. A contract for the program was awarded to a company called Bass, an offshoot of Bigelow Aerospace, owned by Las Vegas space entrepreneur Robert Bigelow, a billionaire who had funded his own UFO studies for years. Bigelow first connected with George after his initial UFO reports in the late 80s. I start getting all these calls. One of them came from this businessman I'd never heard of, hold for Robert Bigelow, okay? He gets on there, boy, that was really good. He kind of introduces himself. I had no idea that he had already been funding UFO research. He offered to help. He was going to want to give me money to go ahead and pursue the investigation. I said, no, 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 can't do that. I'm working for Channel 8, but I appreciate your offer of support and maybe we can get in touch. That friendship that I developed with Bigelow then proved so important in the long run. And eventually Reed and Bigelow got yeah. together and I introduced him. George reported on every step of the new project. Bigelow built secure facilities inside his aerospace company. At its peak, the study had 46 scientists working at the Nevada facility, writing reports and analyzing data that came in from the military. Rapid response teams were dispatched to the scene of UFO events. Over the five years, the project cost a total of $22 million. So you knew that the U.S. government was funding a secret program <laughs> and you just had to stay quiet? Yeah. They asked me to be part of it. I was asked twice to get a security clearance so that they could bring me in and show me stuff. I was not privy to everything that was going on. I did not have a security clearance, so I'd get bits and pieces, big picture stuff about what they were doing. And most of what they did was not classified, but it was very restricted, you know, it was kept in a stovepipe. And during the five years of research, Robert Bigelow's team made an unexpected finding. Details of a UFO resembling a Tic Tac off the west coast of the United States. Over a two-week period in late 2004, an unknown 45-foot-long Tic Tac-shaped object played cat and mouse with the U.S. Navy off the coast of California. Even before a bombshell New York Times story on the Tic Tac, George knew about it. The USS Nimitz aircraft carrier and its support ships carrying the most sophisticated sensor systems in the world repeatedly detected recurring glimpses of the Tic Tac but were unable to lock on. On November 14th, F-18s were ordered into the area and saw it up close. Veteran pilot Dave Fravor, commander of the elite Black Aces unit, says the Tic Tac reacted to the presence of the F-18s, then took off like a bullet fired from a gun. If you go from what, what I saw, which is very close to what Bob describes, that would change mankind. It's one of the reasons why you believe what you saw in 2004 was not ours. It, it was yeah, not. like I said last night, I think a lot of it was, if you'd have asked me in 2004, I didn't know. My thing is, it's now almost 15 years later, and that technology is still, they, no one has figured it out or no one has seen it. You can hide stuff, you can hide stuff for a long time, but hiding stuff for 15 years is, I think it gets harder and harder. Something that revolutionary. Yes, I mean, it's, that's literally, a, why would you hide a huge technology leap for mankind if you have it? OSAP had created the world's largest UFO database, 200,000 cases, a data warehouse of what it was. They put together an amazing pile of work in a short period of time. A stack of documents, if you printed out the pages, would be taller than, than either of us. In-depth reports about different topics. The Tic Tac, there's an investigation, an explanation of the Tic Tac that is so much more advanced than anything that anyone has seen. Congress has not seen one page of that stuff. The public hasn't seen one page of it. Where is it all? Good question. I don't think the DIA can find it. You know, we've seen these uh, reports and documents that we've obtained and photos uh, and information from uh, the Navy about 
these drones buzzing their ships and they don't know where they came from. They can't track them. They're coming in swarms, swarms like bees, like uh, insects. I don't know if it's scarier that it's an unknown or if it's scarier that our adversaries have made great strides in technology. And always remember, Russia, former Soviet Union, is run by a man who ran the KGB. They had as many as 30,000 agents at one time, KGB, KGB agents. So Russia's involved in this, no question about it. Coming up, George travels 6,000 miles from Vegas to Moscow. There was a period of 78 to 88 where the Russians had had these dramatic UFO incidents. And wait until you hear what he came back with. Plus, never before heard parts of our exclusive interview with UFO whistleblower David Grush. As George Knapp started to become synonymous with UFO reporting, he started to look outside the U.S., specifically at Russia. So there comes this high-level Russian scientist to Las Vegas. We have a couple of beers, I ask him about UFOs. You ever hear anything about it? He goes, no, don't think so, doesn't ring a bell. We have one more beer. He goes, you know, now that you mention it, there's a friend of mine at KGB who said he had worked on a report about UFOs and some documents. I could ask him about it. I said, you think there's anybody else who might know in the Ministry of Defense? Well, I know all those guys, I could find out. So he said, yeah, I'll do it. Behind the scenes, George planned a high stakes trip in 1993 with Russia in turmoil and sources ready to talk. We're there 10 days. We were pulled over by cops seven times. There were people stationed outside of our rooms at the hotel. I, I would put little, little traps to see if they went through my stuff, which they did every single day. Uh, we met with this guy, Boris Sokolov, who had been the head of what was then the largest UFO investigation conducted by a government in the history of the world. There was a period of 78 to 88 where the Russians had had these dramatic UFO incidents and they decided to create a program to get to the bottom of it. And man, well that was really something. Uh, I won't explain exactly how I got access to the files, but I did, thousands of pages from the Russian Ministry of Defense. Many of those pages were classified at, at the time. Um, so then we had the problem of how to get it out. Well, that's what I was gonna ask. Uh, it was pretty tricky. What did you do? Well, these documents, in those days at least, the Russian Ministry of Defense would stamp classification on the top page of the document, and the rest of them weren't marked at all. It was clear they're military documents, but without that classification, it's a lot less uh, onerous and dangerous. I just removed the top pages of all those documents. And uh, I threw the rest of it in my suitcase with some caviar, by the way, which they told us we were not allowed to take out caviar. So I threw some caviar in there as a diversion. And it worked because they opened it up. They're looking, hey, caviar, not allowed. Close the suitcase back up. And then the other pages, I, I carried through security. I carried on my person. If they caught me, I'd still be there in a gulag somewhere, but they didn't. And it, you know, the goal was maybe we'll find out more from the Russians about what our government knows about UFOs than we'll ever learn from our government itself, which is true, we did. George started sharing his findings with key players in Washington and his friends, Senator Reid and Robert Bigelow. I'd ask Colonel Sokolov, what's the interest? What are you trying to do here? And he said, it's really simple. These craft can do things that we can't. They fly circles around our best aircraft. We know they do the same thing to you. And we figured if we could find one, figure out how they work, we could kick your ass in terms of stealth technology. Because at that point, we were way ahead of them. Three years later, George returned to Russia and came back with even more bombshells. I interviewed this guy named Maltsev, who'd been commander of the entire Russian Air Forces. And he told me about these encounters that Sokolov had recounted. 40 different incidents where Russian warplanes chased UFOs and boom, they, they were gone. In three of those cases, though, the Russian warplanes crashed. Two of the pilots died. And after that, this guy Maltsev issued an order, leave them alone. You see a UFO, leave them the hell alone because, quote, they have incredible capacities for retaliation. More than 25 years later, a Pentagon whistleblower shared the exact same fears that George reported back then, a secret Cold War with some of our biggest enemies. We're in a competition with their adversaries to understand this. It's a multi-decade Cold War that uh, has been under our nose for so long, and you know there is no good way to level the playing field and hold other nation states accountable if they're doing unethical or illicit uh, activity as it relates to this subject. 
And I think the obtuse secrecy is actually putting us in a very dangerous position where uh, a country might make a breakthrough. Let's say we, um, it's an adversary of ours. And it is so destabilizing. In June 2023, a worldwide exclusive interview on News Nation revealed alleged secrets within our own government. What conclusion did you come to at the end of your time on the UAP task force? Uh, the UAP task force was refused access to um, a broad crash retrieval program. We have spacecraft from another species. We do, yeah. How many? Quite a number. You're kidding. No. I thought it was totally nuts, and I thought at first I was being deceived, it was a ruse. People started confiding in me, they approached me. I have plenty of current and former senior intelligence officers that came to me, many of which I knew almost my whole career, that confided in me they were a part of a program, they named the program, I've never heard of it, and they, they told me, based on their oral testimony, um, and they provided me documents and other, other proof, that there was, in fact, a program that the UAP task force was uh, not read into. I've been told that there have been attempts to bring down craft. There have been instances, and there are uh, certain techniques. Have human beings been hurt or killed by a non-human intelligence? While I can't get into the specifics, because that would reveal uh, certain US classified in, uh, operations, uh, I was briefed by a few individuals on the program that there were um, malevolent events like that. Yeah. Including this never before seen moment where Grush describes the roadblocks he says he faced when trying to pry for answers. You're telling us we're being lied to. Yeah, it's an obvious intelligence community disrespect to the legislative branch and I I tried to gain access in my official capacity and, you know, I had one agency say, hell yes, we have what you're looking for, we'll read you in. Um, and then two months went by, they wouldn't return phone calls, they wouldn't return um, inquiries uh, by the UAP task force director, my colleagues with uh, the same kind of statutory authority to investigate this. And um, in one case, they, they tried to kill all my security clearances from that particular agency is almost like a show of force, like, please don't ask again, Dave. And I, I thought that was extremely unprofessional. And yet you were legally entitled to seek this information. Yeah. I, I stated us. my official capacity to look into this. This wasn't me trying to get access to a program I wasn't supposed to or anything like that. I, this was in my official capacity. Grush's story, first shared publicly in June, was actually known to George well before then. I had been told there's, I might be introduced to somebody. I'm sitting at a bar and they're shooting video of me, just cutaways. And at that exact moment, while they're getting video of me, Dave Grush walks up and introduces himself. And we started a conversation and got to know each other. And we've been talking ever since. And boy, he shared with me something that I wasn't allowed to make public then, but it was in his whistleblower complaint, what he had filed with the inspector general, because at that point they were already coming after him. Now he had come to that conference to meet people, to learn about UFOs, to interact with UFO world a little bit, and to interact with Jay Stratton, who was, you know, the guy who had given this assignment. He didn't come alone, though. Grush came with his, his boss and his boss's boss. They also went to this thing. They knew what he was up to. They knew what he had found. They haven't come forward, which is interesting that nobody's asked them uh, uh, questions about what he was doing or whether it was legitimate. But they were there because they knew what he'd found and they wanted to support him. We've heard these stories for, for years that there's reverse engineering, crash saucers, UFO secrets stashed in there, hidden by the use of hundreds of millions of dollars of national security dollars that are unaccounted for, that Congress has no idea what's being spent on. Go find it. And he did. He had the clearances to go into those special access programs, interview the people, put them under, under oath, get their testimony, collected it all, and sent it, sent it up the stairs, up the chain of command. And once it became clear what he was doing, what he was going after, he was messing with the fundamental forces of nature. These are powerful interests that have this stuff. The keepers of the secrets are real, and they're not gonna give it up, so they came after him. Coming up, 
It all comes full circle as George is front row for historic UFO congressional hearings. The multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. David Grush's claims on News Nation sparked an unprecedented move in Washington. A historic hearing specifically focused on disclosure and getting answers about what the government truly knows about UFOs. Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking members and congressmen, uh, thank you. I'm happy to be here. This is an important issue and I'm grateful for your time. My name is David Charles Grush. I was an intelligence officer for 14 years. I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. And seated right behind the three key witnesses was none other than George Knapp. So how did you end up in the front row right there of the hearings? Well, uh, these members of Congress haven't been at it that long. They knew they needed help. They wanted to set up a hearing. Do you have any personal knowledge of people who have been harmed or injured in efforts to cover up or conceal these extraterrestrial technology? Yes. Personally. Would you have had the capability to defend yourself, your crew, your aircraft? Absolutely not. Sir? No. My main concern was that it needed to be bipartisan. It can't just be Tim Burchett and other Republicans, uh, one-sided kind of a thing, because the temptation to be really partisan, you can't help it. And he agreed to that. He said, yeah, we're going to make it bipartisan. We got some Democratic members who are interested in it. And he did. He kept his, his promise. And, uh, and thank you all for being here and the courage it took to come forward and, and again, the sacrifice that each of you have made. Is it possible that these UAPs are testing for vulnerabilities in our current systems? Yes. Yes, possible. Is based off of the information that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs are interested in our nuclear technology and capabilities? Yes. Okay. By external observation, sure, that could be a fair assessment, yeah. Yes. Is there any indication that the Department of Energy is involved in UAP data collection and housing? I don't have an answer. I can't confirm or deny that in a public setting. No. Could you do it in a, in a secure setting? Yes. For the record, if you were me, where would you look? And I put that as an open question to the three of you. I'd be happy to give you that in a closed environment. I can tell you specifically. Thank you. Um, Commander Fravor? And I would say, and I've told people that you, you have to know where to look. They're not going to divulge it to you because of the classification levels. But if you know where to look and who to talk to, which is exactly what Mr. Grush can point you, then you, then you have them. Okay. Mr. Graves? I was an operator, so I was defending on folks like Mr. Grush to do that homework. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back to the chair. Congress, it's a perilous moment for them right now. You saw those members of the House. They were very passionate at that hearing. They wanted to get to the bottom of this. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness, like how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Absolutely astonishing for me to see Tim Burchett and Matt Gates as far right as you can get. And over on the other side is AOC and Jamie Raskin, and they're all asking pointed questions. They're all into it. These are not questions just prepared by staff. They're listening to the witnesses and asking good stuff. And they are, they're pissed off. But as I have said a hundred times, the keepers of the secrets are better at their job than I am, people like us are at ours. And they are not gonna let this thing go easily. The pushback has already begun. So yeah, it's interesting. Burchett said that too. There were other witnesses that backed out. Well, I think there was a statement about other witnesses. They didn't pass their security clearance or something, and that was not the case. Okay. There was two other witnesses that we tried to get who declined to be part of it, but they might do it at some future point. Well, how do you think the, the Pentagon is going to react given you know your experience covering this issue? You know, they've they've resisted being truthful for 75 years. It's not going to turn around on a dime. But after what happened today, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. Mr. Nat, I've been covering this for years, decades. Is today surreal for you? Yeah, it's weird. It's really it's just weird to see it finally happen. I had a moment where it kind of overwhelmed me um, thinking about uh, 
gosh, this is happening right in front of my eyes after all these years, progress finally being made. Uh, it, it, was, it was quite a moment. It was quite a moment. I wonder, are we going to be able to figure out these mysteries even if we have, say, a crash saucer? Does it tell us where they're from? or why they're here, or what their interest is in us. I've been up pretty far up the food chain. I don't know anyone who knows the big picture. Do you think there's someone behind the scenes that does? I think there's, uh, there are people behind the scenes who know a lot more than we do, a lot more than I do, a lot more than OSAP learned. I've heard about these people for a long time, and somebody pulls these strings. I don't know that there was ever an MJ-12, but I suspect that there was an organization like that. You know, I, I'd love to have the answers while I'm still alive and kicking here but I'm not sure that that's gonna happen. It seems like this is the worst possible moment for you to retire, <laughs> which you're obviously not retiring, but are you working harder than ever, would you say? Seems like it. I tried to retire. It, it lasted two months, and uh, yeah, it'd be pretty hard to walk away from it now. George has teamed up with UFO researcher Jeremy Corbell for his podcast, Weaponized. They continue to be at the forefront of breaking some of the biggest stories. Congress has made it pretty clear. They want this information. They want to have access to it. They want whistleblowers who have information, direct hands-on experience with these legacy programs to step forward. Those people are really reluctant, as we know. We talk to them. We, we, have, we have passed people through the process that are verifiably who they say they are. Other people whose names are not yet known to the public or to the UFO world who want to tell the story. And George says there's more to come. There are more whistleblowers, and there will be more that will come out. Uh, we know some of them. There are some big shoes still to drop. Do you think it sunk in for you how pivotal you were in all of that? I lucked into it a lot, and I'll I'll take credit where, you know, I'll, I'll take credit if somebody wants to give me some of it here and there, but moving here in the first place, getting to know Lazar and Lear and all that, to where it led. You may not find out in a, a month, a year, five years or 10 years, but you'll look back at what I'm telling you now, and you'll say to yourself, my gosh, the son of a gun was right. You gotta work it. You know, like a like a reporter does. Yeah. You got to if it becomes your beat, you work it. I think uh, what we can say about this is there is a body of information. There is some kind of a phenomenon here that can't just be written off. The government is sitting on a certain amount of information that it isn't letting us know about. And I don't think the topic has been fairly treated by science and journalism. It would be interesting if we could have a much larger investigation yeah. by someone else. It does seem a lot more mainstream now, though, to have these conversations. I'm thrilled when I see other media covering it. It's fun. The public's interested. Our listeners, our viewers, our readers are interested. And it's important, too. I mean, the big picture, if we could get to the bottom of it, it changes everything. George Knapp, Channel 8 Eyewitness News.